Okay, guys, this is the first part of the section on institutional violence. Um, remember, institutional violence is when the perpetrator is acting within their role um, of that institution. And the biggest social institution is the family. Um, this is a pretty lengthy um, section. Um, so depending on how this goes, we may split it into two uh, recordings, but we'll see how it goes. Maybe if I can get my clicker to work. Okay. Um, so we're going to define institutional violence, look at the history of laws about spousal abuse, patterns of spousal abuse, the dynamics of spousal abuse, and we'll talk about child mistreatment, um, the difference between abuse and neglect, patterns of child abuse, um, neglect, and then elder violence, sibling violence, violence directed at pets, and then dating violence as a precursor to family violence, and then a general global perspective. So institutional violence, as I said, is violence that occurs by acting within a societal institution. So you're playing your role within the institution, you're just committing violence in that role. This can be people in families, this can be people in education like teachers, this can be people in um, police positions or clergy positions. These are all incidents of institutional violence. Um, the last few years has seen quite a lot of media coverage as far as institutional violence. Um, I was really surprised that not very many people had chosen that as their case study topic, considering the um, incidents with the Catholic priesthood and um, the um, Black Lives Matter movement with the police brutality and the incidents of um, statutory rape with um, school teachers. So all of those things are considered institutional violence. Um, but specifically right now, we're going to just talk about family. So spousal abuse, unfortunately, as is as old as the institution of marriage itself. Um, the right of husbands to beat their wives um, goes back to Roman law, which originally permitted a husband to kill his wife if she committed a variety of offenses, um, especially adultery. And for a long time, um, back during the Dark Ages and Middle Ages and Renaissance and stuff, um, women were routinely subjected to physical violence. Gradually during the latter half of the 19th century, um, legislation on both sides of the world began to remove males, um, you know, automatic entitlement to, um, use violence against their spouses. Uh, this was the first um, kind of women's movement which occurred right after the Civil War. Um, in general, uh, North American law uh, has followed the British counterpart in shaping um, laws about women, uh, battered women and stuff. Um, the rule of thumb, if anybody doesn't know, is actually um, a law related to the size of the stick that you were allowed to beat your wife with. 
Um, it could be no thicker than the husband's thumb. So I imagine there's probably quite a few um, people who were more interested in marrying a man with small hands. Um, I guess if that were the law. Uh, in the latter half of the 20th century, the during the second women's movement, the the U.S. led the erosion of the public versus private distinction in law enforcement. Um, they established shelters to protect battered women and their children. So it wasn't just, you know, the, the private law that, you know, what happens in the house, you know, the, the police were involved and there was more, um, proactive, uh, strategies. Um, today there are women shelters in all 50 States um, and most medium and large cities. I know that working in mental health, that there are, there's at least one in every county surrounding Fort Wayne. And I know there's several in Fort Wayne. So, um, on the flip side of that, there's not a lot of shelters for men, um, though there is um, spousal abuse towards men does happen. They generally don't take the children with them, though, I think, which is um, part of the, the concern there. Um, patterns of spousal violence, assault between married partners or cohabitating adults. Um, has not really been something that the authorities have taken as seriously as assault between two strangers. Um, there's kind of this idea that, you know, it, this is something that's, that's better, you know, handled between the two of you. We'd rather not get involved. You know, it's, it's your business and it's a, it's a private matter. Um, but there's also a reluctance to report violence um, by a spouse because of the economic position of the victim, which is generally females. They are dependent on their spouses for financial support. And if they report that abuse and the husband goes to prison or goes to jail, then her and possibly her children are left without a source of income or without a home to live in. Um, statistically, there's a lot of problems with how we track statistics. Um, no one really knows for sure how many battered women there are at any given moment due to this lack of reporting. And the, the best way to look at it is through victimization surveys and studies of women shelters, um, but you have to get the surveys into the hands of the victims and get them to, to uh, acknowledge it. And as with any sort of uh, survey research, there's, you know, the issue of um, compliance with filling in the information. So... Uh, in both 1975 and 85, um, Strauss and his team conducted national surveys, and the results show a considerable amount of violence. Almost one out of every eight American husbands carried out one or more violent acts in 1985, and three out of every 100 women and in their study that year. So you can see that women are also contributing to the violence versus their, you know, against their spouse, but it is at a much lower rate. So the thing was though, you know, is it, is it just the men assaulting the women? Um, further research by Stacy and Shoup, um, they did interviews of shelter residents, found that women committed roughly an equal amount of violence, but men were more likely to cause severe harm and injury. 
So even though the women are committing violence, it's not causing as much damage. It's not as severe um, as what the men are, are making. So they claim that there's this cult of violence in American society, an environment of patriarchy and glorification of violence that serves as a, a base for this type of violence to allow it to, to flourish more. So there's these three dynamics of family violence. There's three levels. Um, there's the social structural, which is the system of patriarchy that's endemic in the, in the entire country and almost every modern society. So this is the big umbrella um, of patriarchy, where it is the men leading the charge of all systems. And then there's the cultural level, which is the stereotypes and normative ideas and gender norms and expectations about what's gender appropriate behavior. This is the the everyday stuff that we're seeing in advertising and we're seeing in um, the roles that we're expected to play when we're out in our communities. And then there's the social psychological level, which is concerned with the interaction between individuals' differences and their sociocultural influence, different or influences in socialization personality and anger management, communication skills. So this is how we interact with each other. Personalities, how you solve conflict. So those are the three levels. So looking more at the social structural, um, the history of Western civilization um, reveals that the family unit has resembled an asymmetric power hierarchy. This is the domestic patriarchy. Um, it is simply a system of stratification that's determined by age and gender. So if you look at, okay, you have a family of, let's say you have a, a family of three. You have a husband, a wife, and a child and you're ranking them top to bottom by order of quote unquote you know power within the family the husband is usually at the top followed by the wife followed by the child it's also important to remember that domestic patriarchy is dependent on the support from the larger society And the family is only one unit of this domestic patriarchy. Um, these systems would not be in place within the family if they were not in place within the system at large. Patriarchy is reinforced by every other social institution within our society. It's reinforced by religion, it's reinforced by economy, it's reinforced by the government, and it's reinforced by various educational organizations as well. Inequality of power in marriage is a reflection of gender inequality in the larger society. There is a direct relationship between patriarchy and socioeconomic class and the use of violence. So levels of spousal violence mirror the inequality in a larger society. So this shows the gender gap in income. And if you look in the places where the man is earning all or most of the income, you know, he has all the resources, he has the checking accounts, he has the employability, he has um, the cars and stuff like that. 
the female is less likely to have independent access to any of those things. Uh, cultural dimensions. Um, these are the ideas of masculinity and femininity within the patriarchal society. So the idea of the um, this macho ideal of male supremacy and control. Um, this goes along with, you know, um, violence, sexual aggression, alcohol and drug use, um, with her being tolerant and reserved and passive. Um, you know, the expectation or the, the understanding that his inability to communicate openly um, about his needs and feelings because um, you know men aren't supposed to talk about their feelings and then the female is supposed to communicate openly and she's supposed to be constructive and she's supposed to share her feelings so these are kind of the the gender expectations and the norms set for a relationship you know he is supposed to be reserved um she is supposed to be very emotional um he is supposed to be less involved in, you know, the, the daily, you know, housework, quote unquote, um, you know, cause he goes to a real job. Um, and then she's supposed to stay home and be the housewife or at least, you know, come home from work and then take care of the kids and do all the housework too. Um, it's the idea of the second job that, um, women have culturally the one they don't get paid for is the one that they do in the home so those are the expectations um, social psychological um, level um, these physiological factors um, included a high rate of alcohol and substance use um, this is true for both men and women in violent homes um, as well as nonviolent families with the drugs proving to be depressants and disinhibitors. Um, trauma from trauma, sorry, from abuse as a child was a more significant issue. It gives rise to emotional dependence. Um, people who are inadequate with expressing their needs, appropriately there's a lot of codependency with the maltreatment and the violence um i've included a link on blackboard to um a piece by npr on the aces scale um this is the adverse childhood trauma um questionnaire um I encourage all of you to, to look through that and read the questions and take the quiz and see what your score is. Um, so early childhood learning as well as a lack of communication skills, poor impulse control, all of these things contribute to um, a more important piece of the social psychological factors. So the generational transfer of violence, which we talked about before, that plays in here. It only works for learning violence as an acceptable strategy for conflict resolution. You don't learn victimization. So these people who are using the drugs and the alcohol, who have the childhood trauma, who have poor communication skills and poor impulse control, these are the people who are picking up this generational transfer of violence. Okay, so the importance of asymmetrical power relations and how they affect um, 
family violence. So Coleman and Strauss found that when couples have arguments or conflict um, and they have a asymmetrical power structure, which is either male dominant or female dominant, that there was a greater risk of violence than when the couple had more of an equal power share within the relationship. So when you're, when you have a relationship where one person is clearly dominant, that dominant person is more likely to, to commit violence against the other. Symmetrical power structures can tolerate a much greater amount of tension, conflict and aggravation without the disagreements turning into physical violence. So the amount of agreement between both partners on power hierarchy in an asymmetrical couple, the quote unquote legitimacy or appropriateness of the power inequality was a key to predicting the level of conflict over responsibilities um, and ultimately the violence. So the more agreement about who's going to do what and whose role is to do what, um, the less likely there is to be conflict. Um, I think we're going to, I'm going to do this child abuse and maltreatment section and then we'll finish this one and continue the rest um, in the next. So child abuse and maltreatment, it was only during the period of high industrialization during the 1880s and 1890s that the issue of child vulnerability and exploitation became, became out in the open. Um, there were animal abuse laws before there were child abuse laws. Animals and children prior to that were both defined as the property of the adults. And therefore, the mistreatment of them was not considered a quote unquote issue. Um, child labor was one focus um, of the maltreatment and the exploitation of child labor and physical and sexual abuse are still, I mean, they're still everywhere. So what's the definition of these terms? Um, a lot of people use them interchangeably and they're very different. Um, so child abuse is the deliberate and willingful injury of a child by a caretaker. Um, this is hitting, binding, such as tying them up, um, burning them, cutting them, pushing them, um, sexual abuse is also in here. So those are all things that are considered child abuse. Now, neglect is more subtle and more passive. Um, this is the treatment of a child that does not adequately care for the emotional and physical needs to have them be healthy. So this is not providing enough food and water, not providing a sanitary living environment, um, not providing adequate supervision, um, not providing for the basic needs as far as um, health and safety, um, having um, you know, if, if the child is dirty, if the child is sick and not taken to the doctor or not cared for, um, as they should be, um, these are all instances of neglect. Um, national estimates, um, these are the people who end up with a CPS investigation, um, increased 9% from 2011 to 2015. 
the number and rate of victims um, has fluctuated over the past, you know, five to eight years. Um, but there's definitely been an increase of about, of about 4% um, every few years. I think with the current opioid crisis, it has gone up even more. Um, I know we're seeing a lot of involvement with um, children being put in foster families, um, being removed from the parents' home, um, involvement with de the Department of Child Services, and child protective services um, due to drug use in the home by the parents. So that has um, influenced this a lot. Um, three quarters of the victims are neglected. So neglect is much bigger. Um, that's where the drug use of the parents come in too. That's part of neglect. And then about 17% is physical abuse and less than 10% is sexual abuse. And in 2015, they estimated about over 1,600 children died of abuse and neglect um, at a rate of two and a quarter per 100,000 in the national population. Uh, in Indiana, here are some really, really um, unsettling um, statistics. Uh, 77 child fatalities um, were contributed for um, a ne neglect and abuse of the fatalities. 32% uh, were due to abuse, 45 neglect, and um, four of them had a history with DCS, and they were unable to prevent it from happening. Um, in the case of abuse, 85% of these kids were three years or younger. Uh, for neglect, 73% were three or younger. This shows the consistent trend, both nationally and locally, that the children at the most risk are the most vulnerable. These are the really young. These are the ones with um, special needs. Those are the children that are more likely to be abused and neglected. Um, they found that head trauma was the primary injury for fatalities and asphyxia was a um, primary contributor in neglect fatalities. Um, it also shows a pattern of stress factors with um, insufficient income, unemployment, both being a major risk factor in 94% of neglect cases and 74% of abuse cases. Also substance abuse in almost 50% of the cases. Um, another pattern that they showed in the report is abuse and neglect inflicted by a biological parent. Most cases of neglect fatalities and abuse fatalities were committed by the child's parent. Okay, I'm going to stop here um, and continue this in another slide. We still have about 17 more slides to go. Um, like I said, this is a really big section, and the fact that um, family is the biggest social institution, um, there's a lot to cover. So um, I am actually going to um, post a link to the... Um, Department of Child Services helpline also if um, anyone over the age of 18 is a required um, reporter. If you suspect or witness um, a case of child abuse or neglect, you are required by law to report it um, to the proper authorities. Um, there is a confidential 1-800 number um, that I'll post that way you guys have it um, as a reference hopefully you never have to use it but I feel that it's important for everyone to be aware that we're not going to stop any of this stuff unless people like you are willing to to say something um, 
So keep going on all of your projects, getting your work done, and um, we'll finish up uh, starting here on the next one. Thanks.